Welcome, today we are finishing the disturbing Reddit posts iceberg. The iceberg was made by a now deleted user. If you found the iceberg interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have an iceberg in mind tell me in the comments, maybe it will be the next. Disclaimer. This video has elements that may be found disturbing by some. So viewer discretion is advised. Before I read this one, I want to give another disclaimer for disturbing content because this one stuck with me from the first time I heard it. But with that out of the way, distracted husband refers to a comment by Ka underscore intro and reads. This is so late that I don't know if it will be seen, but I'll post anyway. Also using a throwaway because the victim is another Redditor who could be identified through my normal ID. Back in 1995, I lived in a quiet neighborhood in the SF East Bay with my wife of a few years and our 20-month-old daughter. We had a small three-bedroom, two-story house, and one of our second-floor bedrooms doubled as my home office. One quiet Saturday morning I was in my office playing Command and Conquer on my computer with my headphones on, oblivious to the sounds of the outside world. I'd probably been playing for an hour or so when, during one particularly quiet moment, I faintly heard my wife cry out downstairs. Knowing that she was down there with our daughter, I pulled my headphones off to see if she needed help with anything. Until the day I take my last breath, I'll never forget what I heard when I pulled them off. I heard the voice of a man, with a thick Mexican accent, shout, quit yelling bitch, or I'll cut your head off and your daughter. My daughter was crying hysterically. After that, it was like some switch was thrown in me and my higher brain just shut off. I wasn't making decisions. I just acted. I don't even remember pulling the .45 from the lockbox in my desk, I just remember walking down the stairs slowly, scared as hell that I was going to see my wife dead when I reached the bottom. Instead, when I reached the bottom I saw my wife half-naked, bent over the couch, bleeding from somewhere in her upper body, while being from behind by some burly guy with a knife in his hand. He wasn't trying to her, he was in the middle of the deed and was probably nearing climax. I never said a word to the guy. Not while I was upstairs, not while I was coming down the stairs, and not when I walked into the room. His back was to me, so he had no idea I was even standing there. He was holding his knife in his right hand, so that was the arm I grabbed with my left when I pulled him off. He spun away from her and me with a confused look on his face, and I shot him square in the chest at nearly point-blank range, before he had a chance to say a single word. His face went pale as he went onto one knee, and I fired twice more. One hit his neck, and the second missed entirely. I was told later that the first shot was the fatal one. What happened next has always been a point of shame for me. The only thought going through my head at that point was that I couldn't let my daughter watch this man die. Without even checking on my wife, I scooped my daughter up and walked out my front door. As I walked out to my driveway, I saw one of my neighbors standing there, staring at my house, he'd heard the gunshots. The poor guy went pale when he saw me walk out, and I vaguely remember asking him to hold my daughter while I went and checked on my wife. The neighbor asked me if I'd shot her, and I told him, no, I shot the man who was her. I didn't realize at the time that I had the guy's blood spray covering half my body, and that I looked like something out of a horror movie. I then handed him my daughter and my gun, I also have no idea why I gave him my gun, and went back into my house to help my wife. The police and DA gave me some flack about the exact circumstances of the shooting, one of the detectives told me that it was more of an execution than a defense, but in the end they declined to pursue any charges. The man who attacked her turned out to be a guy with serious mental issues who had been previously convicted of two violent one of which was against a nine-year-old girl. Under California's then-new three-strikes law, he'd have gone to prison for life if I hadn't killed him. As for recovery, I like to think that I've recovered from it, but it certainly induced a few behavioral changes. To this day, for example, I can't wear headphones that block out background noise. Even after years of counseling, over-ear and noise-canceling headphones give me panic attacks because I can't hear what's happening around me. I found out later that he'd been my wife for nearly 10 minutes before I heard him, and that he'd actually told my wife three times that he was going to my daughter when he was finished with her. I was sitting 30 feet away and had no idea it was going on, and that fact has f***ed with me for years. My wife had a much worse time of it though. In addition to two stab wounds to her shoulder and upper arm, and the bruising and injuries from the forceful she ended up having a mental break and took years to really recover. For the first six months, she absolutely could not be in any room by herself. For more than a year, she couldn't be in a house by herself, and she never re-entered the house where this happened. For several years, she'd break out in a sweat when she heard men with deep Hispanic accents talking, because she'd hear his voice again. Even now, decades later, she starts shaking if you try to talk to her about it. She's fine in every other sense, but even discussing it freaks her out. 
Thai cry for help refers to you slash fugitagic in 001. This user kept posting this comment. I faced a serious problem of human rights at Fugitagic in Thailand. Please help me. He posted this tens of time in less than a month. With Thailand's factories' notorious history of keeping their workers to work as slaves in bad conditions, this led to speculation of being a true plead for help. Creepy hideout could be referring to a post by a now deleted user that reads The Bridge. This is, was, going to be short, but the memory sprung into my mind a couple days back and I thought it would be worth sharing. I live in North Wales, UK. For anyone who has had the pleasure of visiting, it truly is a beautiful place to live, though, for an adolescent boy, it is certainly lacking in things to do. As a result, my friends and I would often find ourselves mindlessly exploring areas of countryside and coastline. Despite it being quite sparsely populated, in comparison to the closest cities, there is a dual carriageway running right along the coast from Wales into England. Also, train tracks run alongside this road for most of its course, occasionally passing overhead via a small cement bridge. Anyway, there was one night a few years ago, when about four of us randomly decided to try and explore the inside of one of these bridges, as one of the group had observed a manhole covered nearby which we believed to be the entrance. On closer inspection, we discovered that several tools would be required in order to gain entry, we returned with the necessary equipment and proceeded to unbolt the cover. This had to be done stealthily as the train track was right beside us, not close enough to be of any danger, but definitely a sufficiently small distance to cause panic for any train driver. And panic usually means police. It wasn't long before we had removed the heavy steel disc and had started descending the ladder down into the structure. Once we had all safely reached the bottom, we decided to progress to the other side. At this point, we are totally confined into the narrow space that leads into the main area. If you are confused as to what the hell this bridge is supposed to be, you probably should be, because it was rather peculiar. I mean, I would have never known there was even an inside had we not found the manhole. So, as we squeeze and crouch, and at one point scrape along our bellies, to the other side of the structure there is a growing sense of claustrophobia between us. The distance from end to the other is surprisingly long, but by the halfway point, you can look down through narrow gaps onto the motorway below. This was actually pretty cool, which helped keep us calm, in a strange way. At this point, apart from the mild discomfort and confinement, we were still just a group of guys on an adventure. This was about to change dramatically. No more than a few meters beyond halfway, which we could tell due to the symmetry of the passageways through the bridge, one of us claimed they could see some object in the distance at the far end. Slightly hesitantly, we agreed to investigate. Bad move. I reached the end first, and let me tell you, I have never felt the same sense of dread before or since. In front of me was a single fold-away chair positioned facing a wall. On the wall was a partially torn page from a newspaper or a magazine showing a fully naked lady in an erotic position. The reason I don't just refer to it as is because something was different about it, I can't put my finger on it but it seemed more sinister than sexy, if that makes any sense. More disturbingly the eyes of the woman on display had been cut from the page. Removed with precision, not just hastily ripped off. The scene that lay before us had rendered us completely speechless, and an overpowering sense of panic could be felt collectively. That was when we found the condom. The horrendous, gut-wrenching, blood-drenched condom. Needless to say we got the fuck out of there as fast as humanly possible, smashing our knees and shins against the sharp cement edges that lined the path to the ladder by which we had entered. Of course, we were all praying to God that the manhole hadn't been resealed, as it was impossible to tell until you reached the ladder itself. Thankfully the exit route was clear, and we promptly dashed as far away as our legs could carry us. I'm sure this ending comes as a disappointment to some of you reading this, as we, luckily, never bumped into the twisted individual who sits in that chair, but I must stress how radically out of the norm this was given where I live. The reason I mentioned the population earlier was with purpose, there is easily enough people here to escape the realms of crazy country folk, yet nowhere near enough people to have someone clearly lose grip on society without somebody taking notice. For example, there was literally only one homeless man, who everyone in the area knew and grew fond of, eventually resulting in a mass gathering at his funeral when he passed away. I sometimes think, though not recently as I had more or less forgotten about that night entirely, about the person who climbs down into that bridge and navigates through the darkness to sit facing a wall, and do God knows what, that ends up with a condom full of blood. You honestly couldn't envision a more surreal situation. It has just come to my realization that what we unearthed that night has not once been uttered to another soul. As a naive teenager, it was the type of thing you just wanted to forget, but thinking about we probably should have let the police, or at least someone know about what was down there, because it wasn't the doings of a healthy-minded individual. So, there you have it.
Apologies for the length, I got a little carried away as it is my first LNM post and I wanted to make the reading experience as similar to the reality as I could. Now I'm a few years older, and hopefully a bit braver, I'm considering going down there again, accompanied of course, to see what f***ed up shit might be waiting. This could well happen in the next couple days, and rest assured I will 100% post an update as I currently have no job, so time is plentiful. Thanks for reading. Edit, as promised, here are the photos from the return visit. We went early evening, so there was still plenty of light, and as a result I have decided to use a simple filter on most of the outdoor shots, simply to reduce the light, and give it the eeriness it deserves. Unfortunately, I hadn't adequately conveyed my plans to those accompanying me, and they had presumed I just wanted to check out the small area before the entrance to the passageways, as they had been there before. When I expressed my wishes to navigate through the bridge, they instantly noped the f*** out of there. As you can imagine, I was massively disappointed. I hope to go back soon with a different bunch of guys, but I can't promise when. Perhaps, if everyone who would like to see the re-return visit, just leaves a single comment saying update, I could reply to you individually so you don't have to keep checking back, just wait for a message. Just a thought. Either way, the pictures are definitely worth your time. Thanks again guys, smiley face. The bridge, revisited. For any of you guys who missed the original post, you can find it here. Early yesterday evening, a friend and I decided to embark on the revisit to this awful place, in the hope of finding some remnants of the twisted scene that had been stumbled upon several years ago. We were not disappointed. If anything, it was even worse than I had imagined. Aside from what you will see in the photos, the general environment within the bridge structure is practically uninhabitable, as it bloody well should be, and stomach-turning to say the least. The amount of dust in the passageways is actually quite unbearable, but that is nothing compared to the constant stench that must be endured. Also, the heat didn't help the situation either. I won't ramble on, but I must express how vulnerable you feel when navigating through the tunnels. Even with two of us, both carrying appropriate weaponry, the sense of evil was overpowering. The tension is amplified tenfold by the fact that, had we encountered someone or something, the layout of the structure, and the multiple tight squeezes, mean a safe, speedy exit is nigh on impossible. It truly is a hellhole. Without further ado, here is what lies in the bridge. Enjoy. Attic pervert could be referring to a post made by Spooky Moo in Let's Not Meet. My neighbor was in my attic. So, around 10 to 12 years ago, in England, I lived in a little two-bedroom house on a long road, it is a terraced house on a long strip of other terraced houses. Back in the day all the attics were joined and you could literally travel through them, years later they realized it was a bad idea, fire spreading, burglars etc, and so all the attics were bricked up so each house was secure. One night I was soaking in the bath when I heard a noise above me. Thinking it may be an animal or something I just ignored it, this went on for a few weeks only it was getting to the point I would only hear the noise when I was in the bath slash shower or getting changed. I got a friend to check the attic and he told me he didn't see anything, he just stuck his head inside, which just confirmed my animal story. Not much happened after that for about a month or two when one night I was alone, I was getting ready to take a shower as I was heading out with friends, I heard the same noise above when all of a sudden the dog started going crazy, barking and looking directly above me. Clearly I was freaked out and decided to get ready at a friend's house. The next day I was outside my house when the neighbor shouted me, now my neighbor is creepy as hell, small, stinky, strange looking with hint of crazy in his eyes. He asked if I was okay, being polite and trying to show him he doesn't really bother me, I said yes and went about my business. Just as I got to my door he asked if I got to my friend's okay, at first, without thinking I said yes thank you, smiled and waved goodbye. When I got inside my house I realized that he would not know I was at a friend's unless he heard me on the phone, and, as I was so creeped out the night previously I was practically whispering to my friend. Anyway, I rang family members. Told my dad and they all came round, they turned the lights on in the bathroom but kept all the other lights off, opened the attic door and you could see two lights shining right through to the top of the attic, two tiny little holes, my bathroom ceiling was quite dark so I never noticed them. My dad went in, he was gone a while, but when he returned he was blazing angry. He ignored everyone and walked straight outside to the neighbor's house, we heard him shouting for the neighbor to open the door, but he was not home. I asked my cousin to go up to check it out, when he came back down, he told me that the wall separating the attics had been knocked through, most of the brickwork was on my side so it was knocked through from the other side. We called the police, but they told us that there was no proof he had done anything. The neighbor told the police he never used the attic and the previous tenants may be to blame. Clearly, he was to blame the old dirty pervert. I don't think I have ever been so disturbed knowing that the dirty pervert had been watching me for all that time. I never stayed in that house again. 
Holos Holocaust Lover refers to a post made by Pedo Stabber in Let's Not Meet. Very sick person living in cave. When I was about 14, I lived in a small town. My dad was there on a temporary assignment. It was the summer of my 8th grade year and we were about to move back to the city. I had a friend, Lawrence who I met at the local middle school. Since my family was leaving in a couple of weeks, she let me stay the night over at Lawrence's house. Lawrence was a cool guy, but always tried to act tougher than he really was. That morning, Lawrence tells me he found a cave in the woods about two miles out and said, we should go exploring. In my naive 14-year-old mind, I thought this was a great idea. I mean what is the worst that can happen? Winky face. Important to note, my friend had not been inside the cave yet. So we go to the location. It's pretty far in the woods and very hidden. When we walk in, we discover that other people had been there before. We see beer bottles, potato chip bags, and other convenience store junk. Then a little further in the cave, we stumble on this area. This is when my nope meter started jumping. The area had a putrid smell and was lined with garbage. I saw a few needles, at the time I didn't know what they were for, a grocery bag that seemed to be their portable outhouse, and a makeshift bed. Someone was living there. I know there are homeless people in the area, but I am on high alert at this point. I saw some other stuff that I later came to realize were toys, a ball gag, rope, beads among other things. I am getting nervous at this point, we are in a potentially crazy homeless person's den. Then the next thing I found was beyond creepy. It looked like a photo album. I picked up the album with one hand and held my flashlight with my other trembling hand. First thing I saw looked like vintage photos of a prison, however, then I saw a picture of a pile of bodies. I immediately recognized this was a holocaust photo because one of them was wearing a star on his uniform. The whole page looked like graphic concentration camp photos. When I tried flip the page, I noticed the next two pages were stuck together. Then I saw the some gooey substance. I took a second to register what I was seeing. Keep in mind, I was only 14 at the time, then it hit me like a bag of bricks. This man was masturbating to these pictures. I froze in sheer terror because I could never imagine anyone being that f***ed up. It is hard to describe the other feeling I had, but it is a feeling you get when you experience evil in its purest form. At this point, my nope meter jumped from a 9 to about a 20. I see Lawrence right behind me. Before I was worried if I told him we need to leave, then he would call me a pussy. At this point, I didn't care. I said, we need to get out, now. To my surprise, he simply said, good idea. We noped the f*** out of there and didn't stop running until we got home. I realized, when we got back to his house, he had a look of pure dread. I told him about the book. He then told me what he had found. It was another photo book with pictures of women gagged and bound, there was also a picture that of what looked like a child with a badly burnt face. He then heard the sound of someone coughing and moving further down in the cave, I didn't hear it, that is when he came over to me and was about to tell me to run. We finally told his parents later that day. The police were called, but the only thing they found was trash. Naturally, nothing came of it. So, creepy holocaust burn victim masturbator, let us not meet in this lifetime or the next. TL, DR, a friend and me are exploring a cave. We find two photo albums. One has graphic pictures of the holocaust and fresh semen between the pages. The other one, pictures of women gagged and bound and a picture of a severely burnt child. Better hoagie down refers to a post made by wife going crazy in relationship advice. Me, 32 male, with my wife, 30 female, of 6 years, I believe she is gaslighting me and I don't know what to do. First and foremost, yes, I know this sounds ridiculous, and this will probably get downvoted as a troll post, but I sincerely don't know where to turn, I've never experienced anything like this. Little background, my wife has always been sort of a jokester, she has a great poker face, and I'm fairly gullible, so she'll feed me little innocuous lies pretty frequently and delights when I fall for them, but she's never kept a deception going for more than a day. She also got really into weird Twitter a few months ago, and her sense of humor has become pretty inscrutable and opaque to me, but until very recently I've just considered it a sort of endearing quirk. So anyway. For Christmas my in-laws got us all of Battlestar Galactica on DVD. They were always raving about it and neither of us had watched it. I had to leave for a business trip on the 30th, and my wife was sick, so we ended up just marathoning the whole thing before I left. Without giving too much away, the ending is a little heavy on the religious angle. I liked it, but my wife thought it ruined the entire show. I know general consensus is it's a bit of a letdown, but I frankly felt it was pretty consistent with what the show had been building up to the whole time. My wife couldn't believe that I didn't feel the same way as her. I wouldn't quite describe her as livid, but she was mad. 
I figured this was partially a reaction from her just being fed up from being sick for a week, but it was so out of character for her, we barely ever fight, and this was over something so trivial. She called me a moron and ended up tossing and turning after we went to bed, and eventually left to sleep on the couch. When I got up in the morning to head to the airport she was still fast asleep, and when I gently shook her to say goodbye she barely roused, and didn't respond when I said I left her. Fast forward to Monday. I get back from the trip, friend picks me up from the airport, because wife has a class at the gym that she couldn't miss, we'd been texting while I was gone and she apologized for being weird about things, and I thought everything was back to normal, but I found it a bit odd that she couldn't skip a gym session to grab me. I couldn't sleep on the plane, so I hit the hay when I got home. When I woke up, she was already awake and busy in the kitchen, which is bizarre, since she doesn't work and usually doesn't wake up until 10-ish. I commented on this and hugged her and said good morning and she basically responded with little grunts. I was about to leave when she handed me a brown bag lunch, she has never done this before, and said to me, it's cold out there, better hoagie down. I grabbed the bag and just said what, and she walked to the bathroom and slammed the door. I was going to be late for a meeting, so I couldn't stick around to try and make sense of what was happening. After I got out, I texted her frantically to try and figure things out, but she kept responding like it never happened, everything was fine, she loved me, she asked me to please stop being so weird. When I got home, it was more of the same, I assumed it must be one of her weird jokes and decided to leave it. Every morning this week. Same exact thing. Wife is up. Won't speak to me. Hands me a brown bag lunch, and says it's cold out there, better hoagie down, walks to the bathroom, slams door. This morning I had enough and yelled at her through the door pleaded with her to stop, but she didn't say a word. Every night it's been the same thing, didn't happen, what are you talking about, you're being crazy, none of this is happening, she's been legitimately angry with me, and for the last few nights we haven't been sleeping together. I heard her talking to her mother about this on the phone? I seriously have no idea what to do. I brought up couples counseling and she was incredulous. Is this some weird Twitter thing or new meme that I don't know about? Even if it is she's taken this way too far. I don't know how I'm going to spend a weekend at home with her. Does anyone have any advice? TLDR, wife and I had an argument about Battlestar Galactica, since then, when I go to work, she hands me a brown lunch bag and says it's cold out there, better hoagie down. I have no idea what it means, and she refuses to acknowledge that she's doing it. She's telling me I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Edit, thanks for the help everyone, I've been up all night worrying and I'm going to finally try to get some sleep. Taking the day off work, going to try and have a serious discussion with my wife slash her parents slash get a hold of her psychiatrist when I wake up, will keep everyone posted. Update, woke up an hour ago with a huge headache, went to the fridge to get a protein smoothie and saw that it had been cleared of what little food we had in there. Wife was not in the house. Got dressed and went to the door with the intent of going to get some food, saw a brown paper bag with it's cold out there, better hoagie down written in cursive tape to the door. Opened the bag and a can of ginger ale was in there? Went outside and her car is still there, but as far as I can tell she took wallet, keys, coat, etc. We live about five minutes outside of a nice town and she likes to take long walks so I'm assuming that's where she is. This has officially gone way too far. I'm going to wait an hour and see if she comes home or she or her parents returns my calls. If not, I am driving to her parents to hopefully make sense of the situation. Bringing the video of her and a bag. We'll update tonight, hopefully. Edit 2, did not realize external links were not allowed, very sorry. Update 2, no sign of her, got a call from her parents that was just the sounds of them arguing in the background, hung up after about 30 seconds. No idea what that's about. Driving there now, and a comment that reads. I made a second update that was also deleted because people were getting rowdy in the comments. People keep messaging me for the text, so, here you go. The general consensus seemed to be split between me lying and this being a strange story, I guess decide for yourself. I am currently sedated but I wanted to post this update because I don't know when I'll have a chance to next. The short of it is that my wife was not at fault here, I was. I've gotten into the habit of taking Benadryl to help me sleep through the night. My wife snores and I'm allergic to her cats so it makes sense, and over time I've ended up taking more and more to the point that some nights I'll take five or six if I'm having trouble breathing. I know this is probably really stupid, and it bit me in the ass. When I got home from the airport all three of my wife's cats were on the bed. I searched my nightstand for some Benadryl and couldn't find any. I looked in my wife's drawer and found a bottle of hers, she is also allergic to her cats, go figure, but also gets allergy shots. It turns out that that Benadryl bottle was actually where she was keeping her old Seroquel. Both are pink, so I didn't give it a second thought. I popped six. I went to sleep. This is, apparently, where everything unraveled. 
Fast forward to my driving to her parents' house, I started feeling incredibly dizzy about an hour out and pulled over. I sat in the car for a while, but the feeling didn't go away, so I decided to get a motel and confront them the next day. I took a handful of the Seroquel and went to sleep. I got up today in this weird mania. I got to her parents' place at 9-ish. Her car was there, which didn't make any sense. I rang the doorbell and her father opened the door. He was surprised to see me. I was sweating heavily and having a hard time speaking. My father-in-law has always been exceptionally kind to me, and he was sort of straddling the line between concern and terror. I didn't understand what was going on, I started crying. I brought out the paper bag and I tried to explain. I pulled out my phone to show him the video. My wife ran to the door with this pained expression on her face and asked me what I was doing, pleading with me to calm down. My in-law said I'd been terrorizing his daughter, he had no idea why I would do this. I didn't understand. She pulled out her phone and showed me a video. It was me, banging on the bathroom door, yelling at her to come out, she had clearly taken it from behind the couch in the living room. She showed me another of me just standing at the door, before work, just staring at nothing. She showed me video of my behavior after I came home from work and I was being much more aggressive and much less cogent than I remembered. Apparently she had left home Tuesday night. I was alone in the house for two days. I just collapsed. I pulled up the video on my phone, where I tried to. I couldn't find it. All I found were 16-odd pictures of the ground and my feet in quick succession. It was right around that point that I started experiencing this crippling dizziness and this feeling that I like. Can't quite describe as nauseous, but. It felt like I couldn't sit still, and I was shaking, and I felt like no direction was up. The doctors told me this was called akathisia. Apparently, someone called an ambulance because I could not sit still and said I thought I was dying. At the hospital I was barely able to talk and I couldn't concentrate and I just wanted to sleep. They apparently pumped me full of Ativan and I slept for five or six hours. When I came to they started asking me a ton of questions. Once we got to medications I may have taken I mentioned the Benadryl and my wife realized what had happened and explained about the Seroquel. They're not entirely sure, but at this point their best guess is the Seroquel either put me into some manic state or triggered some underlying schizophrenia slash something slash I don't know. They don't really know how to explain the delusions and the hallucinations right now, but it's the best they've got at the moment. They asked if anyone in my family had a history of mental illness, and I responded that I didn't know. My parents are pretty old and I don't know much about my grandparents. The dizziness started to roll over me again and they gave me more Ativan and I went back to sleep. While I was out my wife contacted my parents, apparently my grandfather had a mean temper and suffered delusions from time to time, rambling about things that didn't make any sense and waking up at weird hours to do god knows what. He never got a diagnosis and died fairly young but my mother and her family think it might have been schizophrenia. So, maybe something, maybe nothing. Who knows. So right now I'm sitting in the hospital. The doctor and my wife are throwing around a number of ideas. I'm going to see a psychiatrist who's going to make a determination about what the next step is, for sure. My wife is, rightfully, frightened of being around me in my current state, and while she doesn't appear to be mad at me, she says she would rather my brother look after me until I can get a proper diagnosis slash get prescribed some medications. I have no idea where I came up with the phrase, hoagie down. I was listening to a radio show that mentions hoagies and Philly a lot, the best show, formerly of WFMU, got the box set for Christmas, maybe that's where I got it. But they never used the phrase specifically. I don't know. I have no idea. I guess I just want to thank everyone who tried to help, sorry if this ended up being a time waster or anticlimactic or whatever. TLDR, turns out I'm going crazy, currently getting treatment, very sorry if I wasted everyone's time. I don't know what post or comment, never get a nose job, could be referring to. Some say it's about empty nose syndrome which Cleveland Clinic refers as a phenomenon that some people experience after nasal surgery. It can cause breathing difficulties, headaches, nosebleeds, and nasal dryness. Who else can't speak refers to a comment posted by 3489-639-8634 in response to a comment by Green Dot under a post about the Yarnell Hill fire. Green Dot's comment read, Gah. I can't sleep. My stepdad is the fire chief there. My mom is a paramedic, but firefights too. With 3489639863, 4's response being, you know, who else can't sleep? The three year old, your stepdad buried alive and killed. Disgusting. Coyle said he spanked and pushed his girlfriend's three year old daughter and thought she was dead when she hit her head against the wall. So he buried her in the desert, near Mesa, where he was a firefighter and EMT at the time. He later admitted it and emergency personnel found the child alive. 
however, she died the next day. OP destroys his refers to a post made by then death throw away that reads. Today, I f***ed up by cheating on my ex and supergluing my shut. Obligatory, this didn't happen today, but a few months ago. I was in a really good relationship with my ex and I still miss the way that it was. However me being a stupid horny idiot decided that my feelings for a work colleague was more important. I cheated, she found out. Then the bad shit happened. I came home after she messaged me telling me she knew about it to a trashed house. Everything was a mess, there were burnt books in my living room of which I have no clue how the fire didn't spread to the rest of my house. The smoke alarm was ripped out and left on the floor so I guess nobody could hear it go off. She spread makeup over all of the walls, lipstick spelled cheater on the bedroom door. Bed sheets everywhere, chairs broken, microwave broken with a shit ton of metal in it. The upstairs was wet, she poured water everywhere making everything stink. I'm thinking that the power was out because of this also. Everything was trashed and deliberately ruined. So, you're probably wondering how I superglued my shut. After everything was sorted with cleaning the house up from the kind help of electricians, plumbers, and my cleaning lady. The house seemed to be relatively undamaged. There was something missing though, and that was my girlfriend. I got very sad, lonely, and depressed and didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, I did this, f*** up it's my fault, right? I decided to do what most guys do when they have no clue what to do. I sat on my sofa, opened up hub on my phone, and got to work. That's when it hit me, I wonder if we still have lube upstairs. I looked in the bedroom and in the drawers I found it. It was great. I got back to work with my dick and everything seemed okay for the first 30 seconds. It started to get all sticky, but not like bodily fluid sticky, that horrible dry DIY sticky that you'd get from superglue. My ex probably poured some in there as an act of revenge. I stopped masturbating and I felt this awful burning feeling in the tip of my It hurt so much and it wouldn't stop, of which I has no clue what to do so I went to the bathroom and started to try to wash it with warm water, of which is shit as my house has two settings when it comes to water, arctic ice cold or boiling hot hotter than the sun hot. In the process and panic I grabbed onto the handle to release the water and my hand got stuck to it. I had to rip my hand off of this thing, leaving bits of skin on the tap. My dick was sealed shut. Thank for the NHS. Amongst the burning I called NHS 111 to see what I should do. They ended up telling me that I should go to ANE as soon as possible as this could develop very quickly into an emergency. I got into my car with my burning dick and drove to the hospital. Luckily, they recognized that this wasn't an issue to wait four plus hours to get seen. I was taken in straight away. The glue had completely sealed my shut and there was no way of getting it back open without surgery. Long story short. I went under, they cut the bits away and now my is slightly bigger. TLDR I cheated on my girlfriend, she went crazy and put superglue in my lube. I used the lube and accidentally superglued my dick shut which resulted in me getting surgery. OP's best friend becomes a monster refers to a post made by Bonky underscore Dong, now deleted, that reads. Ex best friend of 25 years is a creepy bestiality enthusiast. My ex best friend of 25 years. Let's not meet. I've known this guy my entire life, we'll call him Mr. D. Mr. D is a high school teacher and head of his department. We've known each other since preschool. We grew up a couple blocks from each other. Every summer growing up, we spent the entire summer walking to each other's houses, having sleepovers, and spending long days playing Zelda, Halo, and other games we loved. He was kind of a weird nerd, but as was I, and that's why we got along so well. I've always loved him and considered him a brother. After we graduated high school, we went on two separate paths. I got into drugs and partying and he went to a private Christian college. He worked hard his entire life towards becoming a teacher. By the time we were young adults, and I was getting out of the worst of my party phase, he was very professional and put together. He got married to a woman he met in college, and got a good career job, everything seemed like it was going well for him. His wife seemed like a very normal, well-off professional woman. Something strange happened a few months after he got married, his wife asked if they could have an open marriage. This caused a lot of stress and turmoil in their relationship. His mental state started deteriorating, and they argued back and forth about this for a few years. It was never brought up once before the wedding, and she strangely had a man already picked out she wanted to hook up with. Last year, his mental health started rapidly declining, he finally agreed to the open marriage. At the same time, he got on Sri's, and he came out as bisexual. I was happy for him. Finally, he could express who he was and be okay with himself. 
I never would have guessed, after knowing this guy's intimate life details, for many years. But I guess you never know, I thought. Shit has just became strange and worse since then. Significantly worse. He cut off his parents from the time he came out until last spring, claiming they were too conservative and Christian. I talked to his parents regularly. Shit, I told them at his wedding, they were like second parents to me. This was very traumatic for them, he's their only child. And he had no real reason to cut them off. Shit has just become worse as time has went on. He told me that him and his wife are black magic slash witchcraft practitioners, which I always just rolled my eyes at and thought was a little crazy. This guy who was always a stand-up, professional dude started acting super degenerate. Having multiple relationships with men and women that never lasted longer than a couple weeks, and telling everyone he knows explicit details about his life. When asked to turn it down out of the straight-up perverted, disgusting things he was saying, he started getting in people's faces, mine, saying this is who he is, this is his identity, and ranting about how his people have been oppressed for years. This past August, he told me and a friend that his wife believes that is a orientation and is just as valid as being gay or straight, and that it's harmless. I was shocked, disgusted, and blown away. This guy's a high school teacher, influencing children, and he said this very nonchalantly, casually. Halloween was the peak. The day before Halloween he came over. It was just supposed to be a few friends, gaming some N64 and smoking a couple blunts. My friend Mr. D came over before everyone else. Bright rainbow flag, colored bag and glitter sparkle nails. Do you like my fag bag? He said. I nodded and agreed. I'm truly not against homosexuality, but this irked me, this is not the same guy I grew up with at all. But whatever, he's being himself I guess. Good for him. Before everybody came over, he asked if I planned on drinking. I declined. He asked me to run to the liquor store with him. I said sure and came with. He came back with a liter of Honey Jack. Oh boy, tonight was gonna get wild. Over the course of the night, several extremely disturbing things were said. At first, there were comments, to a friend, hey Mr. L, meet me in the bathroom. I gotta tell you about my DMT trip, okay. Why do you have to meet in the bathroom? Mr. L never went. We're still confused about this. The more liquor that was drank, the worse it got. No one touched a drop except Mr. D. I call him Mr. D for Mr. Degenerate. First he made a comment about my sister. My sister is and Mr. D has known her since she was born. Your sister takes it up the for Jesus, what? I said, shocked and disgusted. Yeah, that's what all the good Christian girls do, my students told me. I talked to them about I was beyond freaked out, but I decided not to be angry. I had to spend the next 12 or so hours with this guy, it was like 8.30. I'd be angry later. It just kept getting weirder and weirder. At one point, he told us his wife is a bestiality fetishist. When I said this was wrong, he said I'm no stranger to the peanut butter myself, who knows what that means, I guess we can assume he isn't going down to the farm. To top the night off, he started talking about his sexual desires, for a male student, how he was going to turn him gay. When I told him this was really bad, he said, he's gonna be 18 soon, we'll wait until after graduation, to hook up, the district can't do anything about it then. How he failed to see the power play between a student and a teacher, regardless of gender or orientation, is beyond me. This seriously creeped me the hell out. He spent the rest of the night trying to get several friends to let him suck their cocks, all guys who we've known for 10 to 15 years that have always identified as straight or asexual. He crashed by 12.30, usually on Halloween, we stay up watching movies. I'm happy that did not happen. I remember as I was closing up my house for the night, there was a Friday, the 13th opening screen on my TV for Ness on his retropy. I find this pretty symbolic of the death of our friendship. I woke up at 7 a.m. to hear this guy masturbating in my apartment. I started coughing loudly and shuffling my blankets so he'd stop. I think he did, but I fell asleep after. Shortly after he left we got in an argument about COVID, which I believed I had for a few days, but did not and still went out when I thought I had it, I didn't truly think I had it. We did not talk for a week. I tried contacting him apologizing, he basically called me a cold-hearted drug addict, with no future and a bunch of other stuff. I told him I was worried about him, since Halloween, and he's lucky I don't call his parents and have him institutionalized. He blocked me pretty shortly after this. I honestly never plan on talking to him again. I've known and loved this guy my entire life, but I just can't anymore. Something else interesting happened. He had a friend named Mr. A. They were very close, but stopped talking about a year ago, when all this stuff started to happen. Mr. 
He always said that it was because Mr. A was an asshole with no real explanation of events, something about Mr. D being drunk and taking Mr. A's arm and putting it around a girl. I decided to contact Mr. A and ask the real story. He informed me Mr. D had traumatized his female friend so bad she still hasn't fully come to terms with what happened and shortly after, before she told anybody, Mr. D was seen at a gathering telling a group that he was gonna get Mr. A so drunk he could not remember getting fucked by Mr. D or say no. Mr. A is a non-binary. I'm not sure if he classifies as straight, homosexual, or something else, but the important part is he had already told Mr. D on a handful of occasions they would not be sleeping together. So, Mr. D. Let's never, ever meet. Not even in passing. I've known and loved you my entire life, but after all this I have been massively cleaning my house, finding all kinds of random shit you've given me over the years and either tossing, burning, or selling it. By the way you were talking, I'm sure you'll be in prison or dead soon, so I wish you a good farewell. It was nice knowing ya, but our friendship slash brotherhood and time together is up. You traded a normal, professional life for degeneracy, bestiality, borderline pedo lifestyle, and if you ever talk about my sister like that again, I'll beat your No lies. I've been doing nothing but praying, I haven't prayed since middle school, and racing to delete every trace of you from my life since this incident. OP is pure evil refers to a confusion made by that reads. I'm an active before the morality police jump on me, I'll point out that this is the confession subreddit and that I'm posting because I normally have to keep this secret and I felt like it'd be liberating to just say openly what I'm into and what I do, and if you want to be retarded and judgmental, you can just go f off. I know that my preferences and actions aren't consistent with traditional morality, but of course that's all relative to culture, and it's just been my bad luck to live in a time and place where my preferences are considered taboo. So I'm an active which means that I regularly have with children. My preference is for children between the ages of 7 and 12. Professionally, I am a child psychologist, I have two PhDs, and I work part-time as an adjunct at a major research university. Obviously, it's part of my job to understand how kids think, and my work has put me in contact with hundreds of children over the years. I have only had with a small percentage of them those whom I can be reasonably confident won't tell anyone, and whom I believe may enjoy the experience. Of course, child is a complex issue, but while I find it fascinating from a scientific point of view, my desire to fuck them is basically independent from my scientific slash professional interest in them, and in general I don't care whether my actions will harm the child when I choose to get with him or her. I have two daughters, aged 9 and 16. I never touched the 16-year-old. Their mother, my wife, died from breast cancer three years ago. The older one goes to a boarding school in Michigan, where she studies flute. I have been having regular with the younger one since she was six. I don't necessarily prefer boys or girls. Both are attractive to me. I have always been attracted to children, since I myself was a child. I guess as I grew older, I never stopped finding people of that particular age range desirable. I suppose I generally prefer consensual although I also find forced scenarios also arousing. I don't keep a tally, but I'd estimate that I've had some form of contact with 50 to 60 children, full and with approximately 20 girls, with three girls, and with about a dozen boys. I would classify five of those encounters as, but the vast majority were in the gray area of consent, as is generally the case with children. I suppose something that some readers may find interesting is that I have met several other who have similar preferences to mine. I suppose that many of you would be surprised about several things that I have learned in my interactions with other First, about how many secret there are, how exceedingly common this preference is, second, how common with children is, third, how often the child enjoys it, and fourth, how easy it is to get away with it in a society that basically treats like witches. If anyone wants to ask me details note, I will not stupidly reveal any identifying information. So don't bother trying to trick me into giving up my address then feel free to PM me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Don't even know how to sum this one up refers to a post that I couldn't find a link or archive of but found a summary that reads. OP and his maid's daughter mutually liked each other and did mild petting, FYI OP was 10 to 11 and the girl was 13 to 14. One day he saw his dogs mounted each other, that leads him to a f***ed up idea. He wanted the girl to get mounted by one of the bigger dogs, which she agreed. Eventually, she had with his dog, watched by OP. A few weeks later, she committed Bone in the boot could be referring to a post made about a homeless man that didn't take his foot from his shoes for over a year. I'm not even trying to explain how it looked. 
Thanks for watching today iceberg video. If you found the video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can be notified about the next video.